I'm Rona Sterling Collins. Uh, Quistleco is my Inklacapan name. So I'm in Kalkatan, and as Ramona said, our nation is, is quite big. It spans from the Nicola Valley, which is the Merritt area, which is where I live, uh, on a small reserve as well called Joyaska. And our nation spans from that area all the way down to Spence's Bridge, which is where my mother's family is from, and then all the way down into the uh, Lytton and Fraser Canyon area. So our nation is, is quite spanned out. And oh, and Ashcroft, that's right, correct. So that is our Inklakap nation. And, and I really like what Ramona said about uh, really starting to think about looking at our service areas by nation rather than by, I'm not sure how they're defined, but anyways, nations would work really well for us. So I just want to. Uh, reiterate, I think that's awesome. So I want to talk a bit about the actual project, and I really like that Ramona, um, you know, sort of set the table because I think that we have to think about those big picture pieces that she's talking about. You know, when we think about um, our children and families and the work that we're doing in our communities, you know, she said some really important things that we have to remember and think about. And same, and same with Allison and, and Diana, and, and reiterating their their um, important message. So this work actually really started uh, with my son Wyatt. Um, and if you've ever been around me at all, you've probably heard me talk about Wyatt. So Wyatt has autism. Wyatt turned 22 yesterday. And he was in the foyer enjoying all those snacks a little while ago. <laughs> and I asked if he wanted to sit in the meeting. And he seemed pretty kind of not, no, not really. So I think they're going to look for a movie. But uh, um, uh, at the time, Wyatt was diagnosed, and we were, you know, just trying to figure things out with him. You know, he was uh, about three, um, turning four, so back in 2000 kind of thing, when autism was just really starting to get talked about. It was just starting to, to bloom and, and blossom. And back then, I couldn't find a single person in my little community of Mara, which is rural, that knew anything about autism. Even my doctor didn't really know anything about autism. And so, you know, I feel like I've been on this journey of learning and trying to figure it all out and uh, maneuver services and resources for Wyatt. And uh, over the years, I've, I've become a fierce advocate and unfortunately made people cry, not intentionally, but people would cry. And I'm like, I'm just his mom advocating, don't cry. <laughs> just help out. <laughs> but uh, I can be fierce. And, and it's only <laughs> because it's what, what our kids need, what Wyatt needs and other kids. And, and then, of course, I started to advocate for other kids, too, because I started to realize, oh, my God, we need services and supports for these kids. Like, where is it? And um, so um, I'll just sort of tell a little bit of history, and then I'll talk about how this came to be. So um, I was involved in uh, some of the early work with Nizen Men, and back then it was called the Aboriginal People's Family Accord. I don't know if anybody remembers that. There was these initiatives going on, oh, I don't know, probably 12 or 15 years ago around the province where we were looking at actually decentralizing an array of all the children's services from the province. And so they had these regional initiatives going on. So in the interior, for you know all the interior folks, we had what was called the Aboriginal People's Family Accord. And that um, group was looking at how we would decentralize services and that kind of thing. It was really exciting conversation. So that is kind of where ASCD, Aboriginal Support of Child Development, and Aboriginal Infant Development kind of sprouted up, sprouted up for us in the interior. And I was so excited about that because I knew that we would then be able to design and deliver these services in our communities based on the needs of the families. Because, you know, as a parent, I was finding that I wasn't able to access the kinds of services I needed for Wyatt. And um, that, were, that were relevant, culturally relevant, and that were... Uh, set up in a way that was going to meet his need. And I felt like the way things were, um, why it was supposed to fit into a box that was set out by these programs, and if he couldn't 
fit into the box the way they had it set out, then he just couldn't get the service. So for example, the way SCD, which is Supported Child Development, and it's our mainstream partner, had services at the time, uh, the only way I could get one-to-one -one supports from them was if I put Wyatt in a daycare. Well, Wyatt didn't do well in a daycare with 30 other kids. He just didn't. It, it just was too much for him. But they said, well, he has to go in a daycare. So I said, okay, we'll try it. Well, then I wasn't el eligible for a subsidy. So then I had to pay the daycare in order to get the service. And, and I just thought, this is so crazy. So I was paying the daycare to put White into a program so I could get some one-to-one -one for him, which the daycare, the, the environment wasn't effective. And I was getting some one-to-one, -one, but it was not really working. And, and I just thought, what? and I was paying in the end anyways. And I thought, oh my God, this is not working. We need um, community-based services. You know, I need services that are that are based on his need. I need, you know, somebody to take him swimming and and take him to the library and sit and do some one-to-one -one activities with him. So I was, you know, really excited when we started to carve out some of these new programs. And uh, so I've stayed really involved and active and have done lots of work in the field uh, around special needs and autism. And, uh, and of course, have done, I've done work with, with Nizenman for a whole number of years, and now they can't get rid of me because, you know, I just love that organization. So, um, yeah, I just stay kind of attached to them a little bit. Um, I also serve as a regional advisor in the interior for part of the interior. The interior is very large, actually. It goes from our area almost bordering um, over to the Okanagan, over to the Shishwap, over to Stallium, and then all the way up to the Caribou. So uh, we, you know, we have a really big region when you think of the interior. So I'm only supporting a part of it. And so I support uh, AIDP and ASCD programs in the interior as a regional advisor part-time as well. So um, I'm, I'm involved in all kinds of things. So you'll see me sprouting up at meetings. Um, so back to how this came. So Wyatt. Um, you know, I've, I've become an advocate for him and really tried to advocate for him and other kids as well. So I got invited a couple of years ago by ACT to speak at one of their conferences. And so Grace was there and I met Grace and then um, she contacted me after and said, you know, it'd be really great if we could do some research together. And I said, oh my God, well, yeah, that would be great. Let's do our nation unless it would, Nizemin has to be involved. I mean, they're the hub of childcare stuff in our area. So that's how this all happened. And uh, so we were um, <clears throat> fortunate in, in applying for two um, grants and got some funding from a couple of different uh, funding sources that has kind of helped our project. And so, you know, we were really looking at a couple of things. One was, um, we want to hear from parents about what are their experiences around um, having a child or youth with autism and you know just hear what they had to say what are their hopes and dreams how can we work together as a community to better support them and um, you know hold knowledge gatherings to bring them together but you know one of the things we talked about when we talked about doing research is that our experience as Aboriginal people is that a lot of times researchers will come into our community, they do these research uh, you know, projects, they ask questions, and they do focus groups and a million surveys. We've all done a million surveys. A and I feel like we're always taking and asking. And so uh, you know, one of the things I said is that I think we need to think about um, giving back. How can we give back to the community? How can we... Uh, uh, share something in return as a project. So what we did is we built into our project uh, a training piece and, and dedicated a portion of the budget to bring in training to the Nizemin team. And, and so, you know, as a project, we weren't just taking and asking, but we were giving back as well. And so I thought that was really a really cool part of what we did. So one of the trainings was called uh, the RIT, or Reciprocal Imitation Training. Has anybody ever heard of this? Can put your hand up if you have? 
Come on, Karen Bob, you've heard of it. <laughs> okay, so this, um, this training um, was developed by Brooke Ingersoll, I hope I'm saying her name right, from Michigan State University. And it's a naturalistic intervention designed to teach young children with autism to imitate spontaneously during ongoing play interactions with a play partner. So really the intent is to teach children to imitate as a means of social interaction. And um, the, the idea is that it, you can implement the imitation during any kind of play setting with a child or de during daily routines and the idea is that we would teach our workers to do this and then they in turn would do parent coaching with the parents and teach the parents how to do this with their kids. And I think in some ways we do do this with kids, but kids with autism, you know, struggle with a little bit more with this kind of thing. And so uh, we had the training brought in for the day. Brooke actually came from the United States to Lytton uh, to, to run the one day training and introduce it to staff and it was, really well laid out and there was nice videos and handouts and that kind of thing and we got staff to to go into groups and and practice it and they you know they did give us some feedback around you know how that landed with them was it culturally sensitive or how could we make it more culturally sensitive would they use it how would they use it what would they need in order to use it more so you know they did give us some feedback at the end that was really helpful and I'm not going to get too much into that just because of the time. Um, the second tool that we had brought in is called the STAT. Has anybody heard of the STAT? Put your hand up if you have. Okay. All right. A couple more hands have come up on this one. This is a screening tool for autism in toddlers and young children. And we actually really quite like it. Um, and I, we think it could be complementary to the ASQ or ASQ Social Emotional. So Dr. Wendy Stone from the University of Washington and her colleague Courtney uh, Burnett, these ladies came up and, and did a one-day training in Lytton with us on the STAT tool. And basically, it's uh, fairly simple to use uh, once you get the training um, screening measure that you can use with toddlers or young children who you suspect may have autism. And, you know, really take a look at um, their play, imitation, their communication behaviors and that kind of thing. And then based on, you know, the, the information and results you get, you can start looking at developing social and communication goals and, and even some interventions, intervention strategies for those children. So um, we like the tool. Uh, we feel like the staff have said they definitely like it, but they feel like they'd like a little more training in it. So that's something we're looking at so that we can continue to use it. Um, so that was, that was um, really awesome. We also held what well, we call them community consultations, but I think in the proposal we called them knowledge gathering events. But really it was, it was, a way to gather some families, parents and families uh, that had children with autism or um, a developmental disability. And it may not have been autism, but we, we talked more around autism, although we kept trying to keep the questions general enough that, you know, whoever was there felt like they could, you know, participate and provide their, their responses to us. And so we held one in Lytton and one in Merritt, and we focused only on four questions. And, and it was very uh, participatory, kind of small group style, uh, flip chart, paper and markers kind of thing. Uh, what are your hopes and dreams for your child? What are the barriers and inequalities that Aboriginal families face in raising a child with autism or, development, or developmental differences? What supports are needed? And how do we as a community better support children and families with autism? And when we said we as a community, we were talking more about we as an Aboriginal community, although um, we do believe that collaborating and partnering with our non-Aboriginal service providers is also really important. So um, 
I went through all of the notes and, and pulled out a bit of raw data to share with you. We haven't rolled this up yet into kind of a fancy report or anything yet. You know, that's our next step. But the things that our families want are things that I think we all want. And I see, you know, the happy, healthy, safe piece that, you know, Ramona was talking about. And, um, you know, families just want the best for their kids. They want supports regardless of where they live that they shouldn't have to move or they shouldn't have to commute to a, a big urban center to get something. Um, they want those opportunities. They want uh, financial supports, um, trained caregivers, uh, more understanding and opportunities for the children with friendships and relationships and as they get older, employment and recreation and even you know, post high school opportunities. Um, a voice in their care plan, more awareness and education, uh, ways to find their strengths and talents and for things to get easier, acceptance, independence, inclusion. So um, we know that we all want these things for our kids. And, and I just want to comment, I guess, when I think about um, our families, that we need to remember that our Aboriginal families are already dealing with uh, intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, um, poverty. There's all kinds of challenges that many of our families are facing, especially in rural and remote communities that sometimes I, I think are forgotten. You know, when you live in a city and everything's right there at your hands, I th you don't re realize that there's very little in terms of services and one-stop shop kinds of things in a small rural community. And um, so I just, you know, I want to preface that because we all want the same thing for our kids, but when we think of our families in these places, they already have barriers and then you know, those with children with autism or a special need then have more barriers and challenges. So it's layered. So these are some of the things they said about the barriers and inequalities that, that they're facing and dealing with. And this isn't in any particular order. I just popped it all on there. And this isn't everything. These are kind of the highlights of the things uh, that they've said that they're dealing with. And, you know, one of the things, um, you know, as I'm talking about the barriers and the layers of barriers, racism and uh, systemic discrimination, uh, the challenges in rural communities, some of, you know, lack of funding inequities and lack of funding in transportation, wait lists, or, you know, lack of qualified workers, isolation. You can kind of see how these pieces um, are all connected to um, the challenges our families are having in these smaller communities. And of course, this research was done in our nation, so we are talking more about rural and remote. And perhaps families in urban settings may say the same thing. Um, but, you know, when I think about the research, this is sharing, you know, what our families have said to us in our area, and um, these are the realities that they're dealing with. And then we asked, uh, what supports are needed? And again, these, you know, I was telling Allison during the break, I said, there isn't anything really new and exciting we're going to say. I think we know all this stuff already, but it's, it's like, you know, we went through the process of doing the research to, to you know, reiterate what we know, um, what families need. You know, they want, um, they do want an opportunity to have services in, in one place so they're not having to go here and then go there. Uh, they want more awareness and education in the broader community um, around what their child, you know, their disability or, you know, what they're dealing with as a family a more understanding of the child's behavior, 
They want more activities, support, education, respite. Um, they'd love to see the assessments done right in the community. So community-based assessments. Um, and an acknowledgement and support for parents um, around the barriers that they're facing. Advocacy. Uh, one idea was maybe the health navigators need to be right in the community. Um, you know, a lot of times we have health navigators that are based in hospitals and they're more for kind of health or medical related, which is great, but perhaps the concept needs to be broadened. Um, hiring and training local workers. Um, bringing services into the community rather than, again, families having to travel out or go out. Um, that would be wonderful. Transportation, many of our families don't have transportation or access to transportation. And there were more, uh, more ideas and uh, recommendations beyond this, but these are some of the highlights that I wanted to share with you. And then we ask, what are the ways that we can better support you uh, as a community? And it, it's along the same lines. Um, you know, the advocacy, the education and awareness, the transportation. So we're hearing some themes here, inclusiveness, um, helping to navigate the system, ongoing programs and services, um, new programs, uh, transition supports, um, more awareness, collaboration. Um, perhaps if, if services um, aren't in the community, could there be mobile services that could come out? Um, as an option. So, you know, these kinds of things were uh, recommended by families and I think they're really good ideas. When I think about um, Wyatt, you know, and the things we've gone through with him and, and the other kidlets, I really try to share what I've gone through as a parent with other parents so that hopefully in some small way anyways, I'm helping them as best I can. Um, one of the things that, that I found challenging, well, there were a whole number of things I found challenging, but you know, getting services and supports into place uh, was a challenge. But once you get going with it and everything's set up, it's great. And then all of a sudden, your child starts to get older, and then all of a sudden, you're getting to um, age 18. And all of a sudden, the services and the funds start dropping off. You know, and then you have to transition to into adult services. I really felt like there wasn't enough preparation for me for that. And so I felt like I was starting all over again, really, uh, once he started into adult services. And um, so that's a piece that I think, you know, I'd like to support programs and families around a bit more because it really does change and shift once you're into the adult world. And, um, you know, we have a young fellow in Linton we've been talking about and how we can support him, you know, as he transitions. So... Uh, he happened to go missing uh, a few weeks ago and, and was missing for a whole number of hours. And they had search teams out and um, the dogs and search and rescue. And, and uh, he went missing from school. And um, I was just so afraid for him. And so this young fellow is going to be going into adult services soon. And we've been talking a bit about oh my God, okay, now what? What's in Lit and how do we get, make this happen for him? So, you know, that's just an example of the kinds of realities that we're dealing with. So on that note, um, I'm hopeful because we are doing the work. We're doing the research. We're, we're partnering. Um, you know, like Ramona said, you know, we're seeing more and more advocacy um, happen. And so... It, sometimes it feels at times slow, but it's pro, it's progressing, and that's that's really great, and that's good news. Um, I feel like we've come a long ways from where I was when White was three, turning four, and I was trying to get an assessment for him. So um, this is great news, and uh, you know I just look forward to staying involved um, in whatever ways I can, and to to continue just to support the work. Um, that's, that's ahead of us for Aboriginal children and families.